Hello, uh, good morning, nice to meet you. Uh, I'm Kyung Nam. Uh, it is good to be uh, part of this uh, important conference. And also it is good to meet you all, even this is an online program. Uh, this is honor and privilege uh, to be part of this Mission and Me conference. Especially I appreciate uh, all uh, effort from IMM and Act 13. And also, especially, I appreciate Anglican Church in Tikka uh, Diocese. Uh, so I'm, I believe uh, through our uh, collaboration, God will be glorified. And also, when we are working together, uh, God will use us for his kingdom ministry. So today, I want to share about uh, church planting in mission. So let me share my slide with you. Can you see my slide? Okay, give me a second. Yes, yes, we can. Yep, now it should be clear now. Okay, anyway, uh, today I would like to share about church planting in mission. So I put in mission because you are familiar with the church planting anyway, as a pastors. So I'm not touching about <clears throat> just the general church planting, more likely focus on church planting in mission context. So let me explain a little bit about myself and my experience. Uh, I grew up in, in a Christian family and I got called me to mission when I was uh, 13 years old. At the time we had a revival service in our church and one pastor came and preached the gospel and challenged people about world mission. So I thought, oh, it sounds good. So I raised my hand and Lord uh, use me. So that was my first calling. So as you see, uh, as a pastor, church pastor, what kind of message you deliver to the people, actually it is uh, directly connected to world mission. And then when I was 17 years old, at that time, at that point, I was thought, oh, maybe I needed to study theology and became, become, would become a, a pastor. That kind of a mindset I had because a missionary should know, well know uh, about the Bible and biblical truth. But uh, when I was 17 years old, at the time, God gave me a vision to become a medical missionary. So I entered the medical school and I studied medicine and became a, a medical doctor and also general surgeon. I'm specialized in general surgery. And I met my wife after graduation and she is also a general surgeon. So when, I, when we got married, I did not know when I could go to mission field, but I prayed, Lord, when you call my wife, I would go to mission. So in 2001, we went to a vision trip for a week. And at that time, God called my wife to become a medical missionary too. So we started researching on mission organization to join. Uh, so uh, one day I visited uh, WEC Korea uh, at the time I took interview uh, and interview with uh, usually directors, they did the interview. So I took an interview and the director of WEC Korea at the time, Byung-Guk and Boeing knew. So Byung-Guk will give you a lecture at the end of this seminar, I think. And anyway, you will listen to uh, Byung-Guk's story more. Uh, they said a very meaningful statement. The statement was, WEC's aim is preaching the gospel to the unevangelized world. We serve to see a viable church in the unreached area. Even though both of you are medical professionals, you should share the gospel and focus on the church planting. <clears throat> this statement uh, we heard during the first meeting with the director of WEC Korea. So I felt, wow, it's great. Because when I, when I thought about uh, mission, 
I thought, oh, I should preach the gospel, even though I'm a medical doctor and also I'm a, uh, I would be a medical missionary, but I want to preach the gospel. And especially uh, when I grew up uh, in 1970s, at that time, Korea is one of the revival period of the uh, church. So uh, my grandparents and my parents, they planted a church in very uh, remote and spiritually resistant area. So I grew up and I observed that those church is important, church planting is important. So this statement actually resonated in my heart. So we decided to uh, join uh, WEC. And so we joined 2001, joined WEC as a candidate. And uh, because my wife and I, we had a clear calling for medical uh, missionary work, but at the same time, we realized uh, medical work and also church planting ministry is very different. So we want to receive more training. So uh, we uh, receive, we enter the uh, Bible college and receive training there and also one year more training uh, in uh, uh, WEC MTC. Uh, so uh, actually we are very glad now uh, because uh, even in uh, WEC runs uh, MTC, Missionary Training College in five different locations in the world. Now we are seeking an opportunity in Africa by my brother Ogutu, so anyhow, we learned many important theological, biblical, and practical knowledge in church planting through our preparation time. We believe well-prepared missionary can proper ministry for kingdom. Uh, and actually, WEG requires all candidates, uh, husband and wife and single, whatever they are, they needed to receive proper biblical and theological training because we are church planting mission. So uh, why church planting? Because of uh, our organizational emphasis is on church planting. We have three uh, mission objectives. The first uh, aim is as a mission, proclaim the gospel by word and deed so that people come to a living faith in Jesus Christ as a savior and Lord yeah. and become his disciples. So it's more likely about preaching the gospel, proclamation the truth. That is the, our first aim. And also we have a, another emphasis, uh, church planting. Second objective is, gather believers around Christ, establishing churches in the word of God so that they make disciples in their communities and beyond. So actually uh, we focus on not only uh, preaching the gospel, but also we want to see gathering of disciples because we believe without having a church, we believe this church is God's design and God's heart. So we have two main focus. And then the third one is mobilization. Mobilize for missions, recruit, train, send, and care for workers in fellowship with the wider church. So uh, <clears throat> today's session is kind of a click to this mobilization objective. Why we mobilize people? Why we work together with local churches? Because we believe we together actually can do proclaim the gospel among the unreached and also we can plant a church together uh, through mobilization ministry. So we wanna see more and more people join WEC and work with WEC as a partners. So we want to see more and more churches will be established in the unreached. <clears throat> so, we, we have a conviction, each member of WEC is church planter. And 
uh, also we has a personal goal for evangelism and we have a clear uh, clear uh, object uh, what is our aim as a uh, missionaries so for example uh, we set personal evangelism goal each year uh, for example for me uh, my personal proclamation goal is sharing the gospel when I travel with the people and sharing the gospel with my neighbor. Even though I'm working uh, in uh, international office in Thailand, but still I try to uh, preach the gospel with my neighborhood. Some first point, yes, build a relationship, but at the same time, I keep trying to preach the gospel, especially when I travel uh, in the airplane, uh, beside my uh, seat, always there is a sermon, I keep trying to share in, in the word with the person. Thankfully, uh, during the last 10 years, uh, three people came to the Lord through that conversation. So uh, we encourage our workers to uh, preach the gospel all the time uh, and in purpose. And also for church planting, each member of work has also church planting goal. So because I'm working at the international office, so I couldn't do church planting ministry directly. But instead of a, a direct ministry, actually we prayed for specific three people group in Central Asia and uh, our team ministry. So through our prayer, we wanna see that specific people group uh, come to the Lord and uh, we want to see, I want to see a church uh, will be established that uh, uh, people group. Actually, the people group is uh, uh, residing where we served for five years uh, as a church planter. Uh, and also uh, we have a specialized director for evangelism and church planting. So it means WEC as an organization, we have a special emphasis how to develop new strategy in evangelism and church planting and how to train people uh, to do evangelism and church planting. So this specialized director plays consultant role in helping people will start new churches. The specialist consultant was always helpful, wasn't it? And it could give a new insight into, uh, into starting a new creative way of a church planting. And also we have uh, one ministry called Planters. Uh, it is one of uh, WAG International, international ministries, especially this Planters ministry connected to 10 different countries and more than 60 church planters. So we train local church planters actually to learn how to plant a church. So this is also one of our emphasis. Okay, let's dive into a little bit more deeper about church planting. Why church planting? Because of the local church is God's design. So we think ecologically, there is a reason why church is exist in the New Testament. Uh, Jesus gave us a great commission in Matthew's gospel, Matthew's gospel chapter 28. Uh, as you know, this uh, great commission, we, you, when we think about great commission, the first thing is, oh, go and make disciples of all nations. So of oh, discipleship and making disciples and preaching the gospel is important. Yes, of course it is important, but at the same time, uh, we should think about how can we do, uh, make disciples of all nations. Actually one verse A said, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So we can see there is a connection between Great Commission 
and also Acts uh, chapter one. Uh, Jesus commanded his disciples, go and make disciples of all nations and baptizing them in the name of Father and Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them uh, following of, of my commandment. So these statements only can be happened through the power of the Holy Spirit. So uh, when we look at the uh, book of Acts, actually when the Holy Spirit come upon the disciples, at that time, Peter got the power of the Spirit and he preached the gospel to Jerusalem. And at the end, chapter two, verse, uh, chapter two said, 3,000 people came to the Lord and it became Jerusalem church. So my point is uh, Jesus commanded and Jesus promised, and then the Holy Spirit came upon them. Actually, eventually what happened? The church was established. So we can say the church is God's design. As you know, the Greek word of a church is ecclesia. So ecclesia uh, sometimes means just a local church, like First Corinthians chapter one, and sometimes it means local churches in a wider territory, wider area, like. A, Galatian uh, chapter one, they said the church is in Galatia. And sometimes mean, it means universal church, all generations and all churches. So uh, in the New Testament, there is emphasis about church. Ecclesia, the word used 114 times. And in the, in the Acts 24 to Acts chapter 2, 42, it shows us church nature. It involves scripture and worship, fellowship, prayer, and mission. So when we think about ecclesia, ek means out of, from, and to. So it means God, uh, and also uh, ecclesia, ecclesia uh, comes from kaleo, Kaleo means to be called. It means God called people from the ordinary society. They, God called out uh, from the society and they called to become a new people and new uh, citizen of heaven. That's the meaning of ecclesia. And as well as when God called them out, actually God has purpose. He wants to show what is the kingdom through that uh, church. So uh, so uh, when we look at the book of Acts chapter two, verse uh, 42, actually uh, there are several components. The key word is they did it all together. So togetherness is one of the characteristics of a church. So in 2013, we had a WEC CP consultation. And during the CP consultation, we try to define basic definition of a local church. Yeah, of course, a local church needs to have proper structure, leadership and decision-making and running process and discipleship. There are many, many elements in the structure of the church, but what is the basic of a basic definition of a local church? We defined a local church is a group of people committed to God and each other, expressing the commitment to through obedience to Christ and practicing the essentials of the Christian community. So, uh, actually, Chapter 4, 32, uh, describe this kind of a, uh, church, one in heart and mind. So it is the nature of a church, oneness in Christ. They were together in a deeper level of a fellowship. Church is not just a superficial gathering. Church is not just about how to organize church and how to organize people. It is a deeper level of a fellowship. And spiritually, 
oneness in Christ and spiritual one way to believe, think, feel, and one in Jesus Christ. That is the nature of a church. So, yeah. Uh, so that is the local church is God's design and the New Testament is all about church and church growth and what happened in the church about discipleship. That is the reason why we needed to focus on church planting. Second point is there is a missiological reason. Uh, Paul emphasized preaching the gospel uh, in, the, in his uh, old letters. But actually, Paul emphasized preaching the gospel as well as church planting. So uh, when we look at the Bible, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 6 to 8, Paul wrote, when Paul wrote 1 uh, Corinthians, he used the word buteo. Buteo means plant or implant. So uh, Paul explained how church is growing through the word of uh, buteo. So Paul said, I planted and Apollos watered. So it means Paul did not mention about one person. Paul mentioned about group of people. So Paul mentioned about church. He planted a church and Apollos came and watered means make discipleship and teaching the biblical truth. So through that process, church is growing. So actually Paul had a clear mindset about church planting. And also uh, the book of Romans chapter 15, verse 20, Paul used the Greek word oikodomeo. So oikodomeo means a building, build something. This is an analogy when Paul explained global church in the book of Ephesians. And so Paul keep trying to being built together as a, a body of Christ, as a uh, temple. So it means Paul always, uh, he has a clear mindset in his mind about church planting. Actually, during the Paul's ministry, Paul showed us uh, how he did the church planting. Acts chapter 16, as you know, uh, Paul saw the vision of the Macedonians, and then he came to Philippi, and he met uh, Lydia, and he preached the gospel to Lydia. But uh, verse 15 showed us Paul preached the gospel to Lydia as, and also her family. So he stayed there for a while and Lydia's uh, home became a church. And he was imprisoned in Philippi and he uh, preached the gospel to the office of prison he said, believe in Jesus. If you believe in Jesus, you and your family and your household uh, will be saved. So Paul did not preach to one person. Actually, he think about the whole family and even outside the family household means in, the, in his yard, there are many group of people are living that is uh, Paul's ministry place. So we can read uh, the book of Romans chapter 16. Paul made special greetings to different peoples. You can take a look at it. There are names and actually that is the leaders of uh, house churches in Rome. So uh, we can see Paul as an example of a missionary. He's focused also in the, on the church. And also uh, the book of Acts chapter 13, as you know, there is a church in Antioch and actually Antioch church established by uh, people who scattered out because of persecution. And they preached the gospel and eventually they established the church. Why? Because that is from the uh, Acts chapter two. They experienced, oh, church 
is God's design and church is in God's heart. So when they scattered and they went to Antioch and preached the gospel to even Gentiles, Hellenic, uh, Hellenism people, they realized we needed to establish church. But more important thing is you can read it verse two and three, the Holy Spirit spoke to the church. You uh, set apart Paul and Barnabas and send them out to another area to plant the churches. So uh, we can see the Holy Spirit, or uh, he is the initiator of the church and also Holy Spirit continually guided the disciples into the new area to plant new churches. That is missiological reason. The third one is strategic reason. Can you imagine what would you happen if there were no churches in your country? Uh, when I think about, oh, what can I do? If there was, there was no church in Korea, how I could have listened to uh, listen the gospel? No way. There was a church and there is a church in Korea so I could receive the gospel. So uh, planting local churches is a, probably one of the most effective ways to ensure that the gospel is rooted and will remain in a specific village city or territory for more than one generation. Actually, uh, my family became Christian about 90 years ago. My great grandmother was the first Christian in our, uh, in, in my, uh, what I say, clan, big family groups. And she became Christian uh, through one local evangelist in 1930, and he went to uh, one uh, prayer house about uh, five hours distance. So she just uh, walked five hours and he went to one uh, prayer house. So each week, one evangelist came there and preached the gospel. And then she brought the message to our hometown. Our hometown, whole family name is Park. It means our clan uh, live in the same village. So he preached the gospel, uh, she preached the gospel and she realized, oh, we needed to uh, start a church. So she started uh, gathering and then she invited that evangelist to come and our hometown church established about 80 years ago under the Japanese colonization. So through her planting church, actually many, many uh, people and many, many generations of uh, our clan, they became Christian. So uh, for example, my family, there are many pastors and missionaries and yeah, elders in the church. So establishing church is the key for next generation. And also 10 individual believers and there is a one gathering with 10 believers, which one is more sustainable? 10 individual believers is a good and important, but they might be frustrated. They might lose their faith because they, if they just stay as an individual. But when they gather together and worship God together and encourage one another, they can keep their faith and also they can become a bold, uh, evangelist for their neighbors. So one gathering with 10 believers is stronger than 10 individual believers. I served in uh, a Islamic, an Islamic country, 99.99% are Muslims. They, when we preach the gospel, we saw there are several people who believe in Jesus, but they never share their faith with the people because there was 
persecution. But when we planted a small house group, they started sharing their faith with their relatives bit by bit. So I thought, oh, why is different? Because individual, they didn't have a strong connection with the people and they didn't have enough power and boldness. But this house group, they, as a family, they could say, oh, this is our family decision, so don't bother us. We want to follow Jesus. They could become that kind of witnessing to their uh, wider families. So uh, strategically, establishing church is the best way preaching the gospel and best way to hand over this uh, gospel to next generation and generation. Uh, briefly, I want to share seven essential components uh, in church planting. The first one is intentionality. Why I'm doing my ministry. So church planting is the outcome of a clear vision and clear goal in, my, in one church planter's mind. For example, when we went to a uh, mission field, we had a clear goal. Lord, I want to see your church would be established in this Islamic country. So when we uh, make up our priorities, the church planting is the top priority. It means we use our time and energy and our resources for church planting. Of course, my wife and I, we worked in a government hospital as a volunteer doctor, as a surgeon. So we worked five hours per day. So it's quite a lot, 25 or 30 hours per week. But apart from five hours, we spent another 10 hours to preach the gospel and to establish church. So uh, some of uh, our uh, missionaries uh, asked us, why don't you come to movie night? Or why don't you uh, come to come for recreation night? Usually we said no. <laughs> you know why? Because <laughs> there is no time. There was no time to hang out with people because <laughs> we have uh, 10 different uh, individual Bible studies and prayer meetings. So we couldn't do that. So intentionality, because uh, everybody has only 24 hours and seven days and 365 days in a year. So unless we set our priority and intention to see the church, we cannot plant a church. That is the first important element. Second is opportunity. Using all of our possibilities for the four main steps to be applied, evangelism, discipleship, gathering, and leadership training. When we use all kinds of possibility to evangelism and discipleship, gathering, and leadership training, at the time, church can establish and also church can grow. So uh, for me, uh, when I worked at the hospital, I keep seeking who is a, a God's chosen one. So <laughs> keep having, uh, I had a dialogue with the local doctors and nurses. And so I use my working place as an evangelism place. Of course, because of Islam, I couldn't preach the gospel directly, but I could discern who has hunger in their heart. So I invite them to our house and share the word of God. And some of them came to the Lord. And when they came to the Lord, I started a Bible study with them every week. Because I already share opportunity. How to use opportunity? So I kept scheduling every week. You should come and <laughs> learn from me. So through that kind of a discipleship process, actually 
people's faith is grow was growing. And then eventually they said, oh, I wanted to start a small group in my house. That was uh, important, another step. And third one is theology. Clear and right biblical foundation and personal conviction is very important. So uh, you are all pastors and uh, I'm missionaries. And so I already uh, shared uh, what I prepared before joining WEG and before becoming church planter. Uh, that is the background why WEG emphasized at least two years of biblical training and uh, some theological training and some missiological training at the missionary training college. Because without having theology, we cannot plant uh, a biblical foundation for church. Fourth one is continuity. Church planting is a, sometimes church planting can be a long process. So uh, during the long process, we need to persevere and endure all hardship and persecutions. Let me introduce one of our uh, mission field. We, we decided about 50 years ago, let's go one location and plant a church. So 50 years ago, two people went there, but they kicked out within a month because that area was a very strong fundamentalistic area. So 50 years ago, they failed. We kept praying and our team realized, oh, God still wanted us to send people there. So 40 years ago, 10 years later, 40 years ago, two people went there again, same location. They stayed about one year, but they also kicked out because there, there were two strong Muslim people. And then 10 years later, 30 years ago, we sent another couple there. Finally, they started a small group, maybe five local believers. But unfortunately, Islam fundamentalists attacked them and even died a couple of people. Imagine if you, if your denomination uh, try to send the people in this area, in this kind of a hard area, if some people even passed away, what's your choice? We prayed and 15 years ago, we sent back people there. And then a couple of years later, we celebrated Easter service with maybe 20 uh, local believers. So continuity, even though one person cannot do, but we, if we can make a team, the team will go there and keep knocking the door, in that case, we can see the church. We needed to do that. Fifth element is uh, uh, proper practice is important. I'm talking about church planting in mission. It means cross-culturally how we can do church planting. So cross-cultural church planting, the first step is learning language and culture. So actually my wife and I, uh, we learn language six months, only six months. Usually WEC gives uh, two years time to pick up the language and uh, learning the culture. But because we served as a NGO worker and uh, under the very uh, hard Islamic context, so that government only allow us uh, six months language course. So during the six months, we studied a 20 hours language course and every week we took a test. So each week we change our language level and we memorize about 400 pages book, memorize all languages and started doing ministry. Uh, and we started a ministry in, the, uh, in, the, in a government hospital. So the next step is building relationship with the local people. 
So through our work at the hospital, actually we learn more cultural uh, values and cultural uh, path, as well as we started building relationships. And through conversation, next part is abundant evangelism. So already I shared a proper opportunity using that opportunity and intentionality. So uh, in my working place, there is a doctor's room and I sat on the doctor's room and they kept asking three questions. Why you are here and who pay you and, <laughs> and what's your religion? So I shared, uh, I'm a Christian. So we try to start some religious conversation. So through that conversation, actually I try to evangelize people. And then someone, uh, came to the Lord. Discipleship is important. I already share regular based discipleship is key. And then some point uh, you prayed, uh, when is the best time to uh, gather together? So we spent about six months uh, individual based Bible teaching and discipleship. And then we offered, uh, why don't we gather together? But in, uh, in my mission field, my mission context, if, uh, uh, if anyone would know uh, someone becomes Christian, they would, would be killed. So people were afraid. So we had a different uh, uh, strategy. So if one person uh, came to the Lord, we encourage this person to become an initiator of a group in the person's network. So anyway, uh, gathering is, uh, uh, there are a couple of uh, different methodology how to gather together. So you should think about some point we needed to make a gathering. And of course, and next point is a leadership training and then pray for multiplication. So actually my personal experience only we did until uh, step six leadership training level. We wanted to see multiplication, but, but we could not see it because we had to leave the country because of a couple of security reasons. So still there are uh, churches uh, which we planted and they are worship God together at, the, at this point. So we praise the Lord. And for me, the most important element is prayer. So before starting church planting and during the church planting and after church, uh, church established, prayer is the key. Uh, when I look back uh, Korean Christian history, uh, the most, uh, uh, what I say, the most rapidly church growth period was the 1970s and 80s. But at the, interestingly, 1970s and 80s, prayer ministry is the peak season. Passionate on prayer and pray for the lost and pray for the country. So prayer is the key. So even in my ministry time, uh, in the mission field, we prayed for specific people. For example, Lord, give a person to see you in his dream, something like that. Because in, in our uh, mission context, dream and vision is a very important element to, to come to the Lord. So we pray the Lord give that person your dream. And a couple of months later, uh, that person came to us. Oh, I had a dream. Could you interpret it? So, so this specific prayer ministry is a key for uh, church planting. And also survey and planning is also important. So which area is really God wants us to go? So which area is a time to harvest? So uh, discerning heart and good survey and prayer through the survey. And finally, we can make a plan and start sending people. Like we started 50 years ago, one mission field, 50 years ago, they prayed and they did a survey and they 
uh, they identified, oh, this area is a stronghold. So we should go there. So uh, this kind of a seven element is important element uh, in real practice of church planting. So uh, yeah, still we have some time. So I want to share some church planting in an Islamic context. So Islamic context church planting is a little bit different from open countries. Open countries, we can do evangelism in public and we can uh, do evangelism, knocking house to house uh, uh, evangelism program. But in Islamic context, we cannot do that. So uh, a little bit, we have a different mind. The first thing is uh, identification of a church planter is important. Usually I said, I'm a Christian. Probably you said I'm a Christian or I'm a pastor in the church. I'm a missionary, something like that. We have a clear identify, identification as a Christian. But in Islamic context, if we, as long as we say I'm a Christian, they never hear the gospel because they had their own mindset about Christian, who Christian is. So I said at the hospital, I try to share the gospel. So they asked me, what's your religion? I said, I'm a Christian. Following question was, oh, how much can you drink in alcohol? So, oh no, I cannot, <laughs> I'm a Christian. But they said, oh no, I heard Christian drink alcohol a lot. So what it means, they had misconcept on Christian. And following question was uh, more terrible. They asked me, how many girlfriends do you have? So I said, no, <laughs> I got married, no girlfriend. Oh, no, 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 I heard. Christian usually has many, many girlfriends. So what it means, if we said I'm a Christian, they click into their own mind about Christianity, wrong belief and wrong conception. So I thought, oh, how can I relate with people, related to people? And I prayed, one day I prayed, God revealed uh, the book of Acts 11. Actually, disciple of Christ, they was called Christian in the book of Acts 11. Originally, their identification was disciples of Jesus. So I thought, oh, that's it. So I started to explain who I am as a follower of Christ. So uh, I went back to the hospital and, and I shared uh, someone asked me, what's your religion? Uh, I'm a follower of Christ. Oh, are you a Christian? No, no, no. I'm a follower of Christ. Oh, you're a Christian. No, I'm a follower of Christ. What is, so I try to communicate and break, make a breakthrough into their wrong belief and concept. And I realized it worked because uh, oh, we we gave a baptism service to about 16 different people in mission field. They came to the Lord through that kind of conversation because through that part, they realized, oh, you are different from Christian. Yes, I'm a follower of Christ. And tell me what you believe. That was the following uh, conversation. So through that uh, identification, actually we can build a relationship and then genuine explanation of uh, my religious practice is important. How much I worship God and how much I pray, how much I do fasting, how much uh, I attend the church service. So uh, through this kind of uh, uh, religious activities, Muslims can realize, oh, you are more faithful than me. That is a very important element to, to preach the gospel to uh, Muslims. So one day someone asked me during the Ramadan and he asked me, uh, do you do fasting? I said, yes, I do. Oh, 
how much? One month? So what's your book said? I said, oh, uh, whenever God speaks to me, I do fasting. So he was very surprised. Oh, God speaks to you. Yes, I could sense what God wants me to do. So he asked me, so this year, how much did you do fasting? I said, oh, maybe more than 40 days because at the time uh, I was quite challenging time of, with my small house group. So I, <laughs> I prayed and fasting a lot. So more than 40 days, he was very surprised. So this kind of uh, uh, religious uh, uh, sh sharing, actually they can open more mind to Christianity. And also we needed to be becoming 100% helper and 100% proclamation. It means usually uh, people in Islamic context, Muslims, they thought Christian try to proselyze Muslim to become a Christian. So Christian helps Muslim because their purpose. So they had a, a wrong concept about Christian uh, donation and help. So when we help Muslims, just to help them without saying any belief, any Christianity, anything. But when we try to help them, some of them will come to come back to us and ask why you uh, help us. So for example, I worked at the hospital uh, without having any wage. So some point they ask me, why you help us? So I said, because I received the love from God. So I want to share the love, uh, love of God with you. That is the only reason. So I didn't say anything about Jesus, anything about the gospel. They realized, oh, you have something special in your heart. So through the conversation, they uh, started listening to the gospel and they became Christian. And cultural uh, learning is uh, important, especially when we preach the gospel using their cultural values and cultural uh, uh, cultural matters to share the word. For example, as you probably you may know, uh, Muslims, they went to the tomb and prayed. Do you know that? Muslims will go to the tomb and uh, scrap the uh, tomb and pray because they, thought, they believe the spirit of the tomb, the grave will bring their prayer to heaven. So when I preached the gospel, I said, oh, uh, you think that way. Actually, <laughs> there is only one way <laughs> to deliver your prayer to heaven. Oh, really? So I said, explain, only Jesus uh, is the inviting person uh, of our Father God and us. So only prayer can go to heaven through Jesus. Jesus is the bridge, something like that. I explained that way. They said, oh, that's good. In that case, oh, I might need to <laughs> believe in Jesus rather than go to the graveyard and pray. So through using their cultural elements is very important to preach the gospel. And also when one person became Christian, do not take them out from their network. Usually in Korea, when one person became become Christian, we usually say, come to the church and receive training. That is take out way of gathering. But actually in Islamic context, we needed to let them be in their network just to stay with the family and encourage them. You needed to share the gospel through your transformed life. So, uh, because in Islamic context, sharing the word uh, verbally, it is, not in, it is not possible usually. So, but if someone uh, changed their uh, lifestyle, people started thinking, oh, why this person uh, is changing? So they started asking the person why. And through the conversation, actually, 
people can share. So uh, one of our first disciples was a lady and she was quite, uh, before uh, becoming Christian, she was quite tough life. And she had many relationships with many men. So uh, family thought, oh, this, uh, uh, this girl should be kicked out. So that family tried to, uh, yeah, uh, fix her through Islamic teaching, but they never uh, success. It was never successful. But she came to us and she became Christian. And one day her brother visited us and said, I wanted to learn the Bible. So we asked him why? Because I knew my sister, what she did and how she lived but now she became totally different person. So only thing is she learning from new Bible. So uh, can I learn the Bible? You know, actually that person was a very strong Islamic teacher, but he realized he tried to fix her sister with Islam. He couldn't do that. But through the Bible learning and through prayer with us, she, had, she was changed and God transformed her life. So now he thought, oh, Christianity. In the Bible, there was a more than important thing than Islamic teaching. And also openness to depending on the power of the Holy Spirit is key. 85% of our uh, uh, brothers and sisters in mission field, uh, local believers, they had a dream or they had a healing experience, uh, prayer with us. And also sometimes we casted out evil spirit. Those power encounter actually revealed God's power to them. So they realized, oh, Christians, God, God is real. Because Muslim, they, their God is more likely legalistic and are very away from their lives, but they realize through power encounter, oh, God is real, God is powerful. So this kind, so as a, a pastors and missionaries, we need to have an open mind, Lord, I want to see your church through your power, Lord, use me. That kind of a mindset and openness is important. And Verbal confession, confession is a starting point. It means I already said, a verbal confession, oh, I want to believe in Jesus, but actually how we can know he or she becomes Christian, actually through their transformed life. So actually uh, in Islamic context, uh, conversion is a long process. So uh, we needed to keep in our mind. So time's up. So uh, I have a couple of more slides, but yeah, just to skip it. Yeah, this is my last slide. Uh, the church is a representation of the kingdom of God. Please keep uh, remember this sentence. The church is a representation of the kingdom of God. God's passion for the lost will be accomplished by bringing people and building a crisis-centered community. The community will be multiplied by continual sharing the gospel with the unreached by the community itself. Jesus promised, love one another. When you love one another, people will know you are my disciples. So the characteristic of the community is love one another. Love one another will be the way to preach the gospel to the unreached. Brothers and sisters, let me uh, encourage you. Do you have a passion for the lost? I believe yes. And do you have a passion for establishing churches among the unreached area in Kenya and beyond? Yeah, I encourage you to say, Amen, Lord. Thank you. Thank you for listening. That's all for today.
Okay, thank you for your wonderful presentation, uh, Kyung Nam. And um, yes, yeah, so this is, as I um, announced at the beginning of um, our session, so this is our uh, question and answer time. So one person actually um, posted on the chat box. So um, I don't know the title, maybe um, Pastor Stephen Kamau. Um, uh, the question was, sometimes some cultural practices are informed by their respective religious belief through learning and building relationships. How do you balance between avoiding some practices against your conviction and hurting your target group? Yeah, so that is an important question. So uh, actually, uh, there are some two extremes. One extreme is uh, some, there are some group of people think all uh, cultural thing, we should embrace all cultural uh, values and methods because that is only culture. Another extreme is uh, all cultural value and belief and methods should be avoided because that is evil. So uh, today I couldn't touch any contextualization issue. So through proper contextualization, we can discern which element is from only culture. For example, in my mission field, I wear on local customs and uh, I didn't, uh, what do you say, grow my beard, but uh, uh, there are some very apparent cultural thing, but there are some gray area. So in that case, usually I ask local people, why you do that? So if I find any uh, religious meaning behind that practice, uh, I will, I was not, uh, I, I didn't accept it. For example, Muslims, they pray and raise a hand and pray, and then they uh, touch their face. So uh, there are, one Christian group, one missionary said, oh, we should just follow it. But I was, uh, uh, I had some question. So I asked to my local brother who was a religious teacher before becoming Christian. And I asked him, when you pray like this, what did you think? He said, oh, uh, when I raise a hand, and pray like this, when I scrub my face, I thought, oh, Muhammad taught this to do for blessing. So I said, oh, okay. <laughs> so now how you can pray? Oh, I can pray same way. So no, no, no. But you said, <laughs> you reminded Muhammad. So how can you pray? Oh, okay. So I said, oh, why don't you pray like this? <laughs> so he said, no, 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 no way to survive in my country. So he thought, oh, maybe I just can raise a hand because in the Bible uh, said, uh, people raise a hand and pray. So he thought, oh, the, in the Old Testament, they raise a hand and pray so we can raise a hand. So, in Islamic context, when they raise a hand, people think, oh, that person is praying. So raise the hand, but there's no mention about <laughs> scrub face in the Bible. So that person said, oh, only just raise hand and pray. So through this conversation, actually we can discern which one is a religious factor uh, included or which one is just a purely cultural thing. So, uh, it takes a long time, but we can find a clear line between religious practice and cultural thing. Hopefully, it can be an answer for your question. Thank you, uh, Gyeongnam, for your answer. And if you have any, any questions, and if you want to uh, share any thought and any ideas and comment, um, just um, unmute your microphone and say something else. Anyone wants to any, ask any questions?
everyone keeps silent. So, um, the Reverend Dr. Joseph, are you there? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, so um, it seems like no one has any queries and questions. Uh, no question for now. So if there's no questions, uh, we can just end up a little bit earlier and have a break. So are we coming back for another class? Yeah, so it's actually, uh, it's, what, what time is it? There is, um, it's 10, um, it's 10, uh, it's 10, 10 o'clock, right? It's 10, 10 past 10 in the morning. Yes. So why don't you have 20 minute break? Yeah, then we'll come back yes. in half past 10. Half past 10. Thank you. If, if, if but it's, it's still, if, if you're shy, um, but if you want to still want to ask any questions, you can feel free to ask any question now. Um, Jungnam is still ready for you. Okay. Um, anybody, anybody with a question? Please, you can ask. Yeah, presentation was so wonderful, was perfect. So, <laughs> so uh, we, we must congratulate our our speaker today. He is well informed in that area. Yeah, thank you. I have a question. Yeah, yeah. Dr. Munua, Dr. Pass, I'm wondering why planning is the seventh component and not the first one. Can you just make the microphone speak? As I understand why planning is the last stage, right? So actually, the number is not uh, uh, what I say, uh, priority. So planning does not mean planning is the seven, stage seven. No, that is not meaning. Planning is important. Hello? Yeah. So uh, from number one to seven is not chronological order, that is just my presentation. So don't misunderstand. Planning should be the first, but intentionality, why I put intentionality is the first, because without having intention, intentionality, actually we cannot make a plan. So even though we have a plan, without having intentionality, actually we cannot see the church. So uh, planning is important. Uh, so number one to seven is all important uh, seven elements rather than uh, number one is a stage one. It's not uh, my, what I uh, intended to. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's clear. Thank you for a good question. Okay, so... Um... I'll give you one more person the opportunity to ask if if you want any um actually um Kyungnam has got the uh has the outstanding conference right after this. So in the midst of even uh quite a hectic time he's uh <laughs> willing to uh, serve uh, this conference and uh, really, really uh, want to say appreciate and thank you for your wonderful presentation today. So, um, do you want to say something else at last and before you leave, Kyungnam? Yeah. Yes. Uh, thank you for inviting me to this uh, very important time and conference and also 
I'm very glad to see you on screen. One day I wish I could go there and meet you. And also uh, I have a, a conviction. We just uh, uh, became international directors of WEC, my wife and I, about two months ago. Uh, when God appointed us uh, as uh, international directors of WEC, we, God gave us a strong sense. African church uh, needs to arise and preach the gospel to the world. And also WEC needs to be a, a partner of the new way. So we are here. Uh, actually, International Office of WEC located in Thailand. Uh, last year, we uh, moved into Thailand from Singapore. Uh, the reason is we want to welcome all uh, global church and we want to have a network with the global church. So uh, this is a very important uh, momentum uh, for not only for IMM and X13 and also uh, your diocese, uh, but this is a very important uh, meeting for future. So we want to have a deeper fellowship with you. And also we want to collaborate together for kingdom ministry. So uh, thank you for this time. And also I appreciate all pastors and bishop uh, who attended this meeting. And uh, I will continually pray for this program as well as uh, your denomination and your ministry. Thank you so much. Bless you.